in this session I'll uh, finish off a little bit on the concept of the Klebsch, Klebsch, C-L-E-B-S-C-H, Gordon, Klebsch Gordon coefficients. And for most of the board, in fact, uh, so a board is four sessions, four quarters of the board, it's a very big board. You, you've never seen it uh, as a whole, you just see the four parts each time. And each, each session consists of two, two squares, so the whole board is eight, eight squares. So for this session, um, I'll try to explain a bit why um, Klebsch-Gordon coefficients are so useful. And uh, now we, we won't go into depth. Um, you know, the full theory of Klebsch-Gordon is definitely graduate level, and this textbook, uh, the textbook, textbook by Davies, or Davies and Betts, that, that, that we're using. Uh, it's really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an introduction, right, it's for, for people who haven't done any quantum mechanics before. I mean, I can read on at, uh, the blurb at the back. Uh, it provides an easily readable introduction, okay, intended for science undergrads with no previous knowledge of quantum theory. Well, perhaps I should finish the sentence, because... <laughs> Leading, leading them through to the advanced topics usually encountered at final year level. Now, given that this is a British text, uh, final year level, senior, well, let's say it'd be a third year undergrad in a British university is pretty well getting into first year masters at, at an American university, because the, the Europeans tend to specialize earlier in their education system than, than Americans. So, uh, you're going to have to wait till uh, graduate level, master's level, M1 level quantum mechanics to do the fully blown uh, Klebsch Gordon stuff. But uh, you, you get a taste. So, you know, it, it's an introduction. That's the, that's the whole point. Okay, so uh, I'll give you an example now of trying to justify why Klebsch Gordon coefficients are useful. So, which, you know, what's this here? You know, why, why are they useful? So, so take, take the example of two electrons. You ignore spins, right? as, as though they have, you know, it's a, it's a model, right? So, ignore the spins, so say the spins are zero. There's no spins coming to it. So, all you're left with then, in terms of angular momentum, I mean, ta, because uh, two, two electrons, is the orbital uh, angular momentum. Now, uh, so the eigenstates of that composite, composite you know, two, in this case, two-part system, you know, two electrons. Uh, so here's, here's your state, uh, com a composite um, eigenstate, where your J, you know, remember, remember the, from previous session, we, 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 we had like J, uh, MJ, little j here, um, J1, J2. But now there's no spin, so all we have, all we have left is angular momentum. So the, the, the j, little j value here is known as L, because the S is naught. Right? Uh, j equals L plus S, in a sense. Uh, well, well, in this case, it's just angular momentum. So, so, so this, this is your composite. Now, why composite? Because this L will depend on, on the Ls of the two um, uh, members of the composite, the two electrons, and uh, it's coupled. Uh, this, is a cu this is a coupled uh, eigenstate. And why coupled? Because this, this L now depends on these two, right? Uh, so so this, this is your coupled eigenstate, you remember from the earlier session sessions, and we let's say we know uh, the angular momenta of the two electrons, uh, L1 and L2, okay? And so we're given this state. And we're asked the question then, well, uh, okay, so we know, we know uh, ML, yeah, that's the, the component of the total uh, angular momenta uh, along the x-axis, sorry, the z-axis, okay, ML. But we're asked the question, uh, what, what were the components, what would ML1? D. What, what would the component of the uh, angular momentum 
of electron 1, L1, B, uh, along the z-axis. And similarly for, for electron 2, what, what would its angular momentum component be along the z-axis? Okay, so like M1 and M2. Well, uh, this, is, this is an eigenstate uh, for, it's a, it's a coupled eigenstate. So let's rewrite this you know, as an expansion using the eigenstates of the uncoupled uh, eigenstates. And then, uh, so the coefficients then in that expansion, that uh, s weighted sum of the eigenstates of the uncoupled, the uncoupled eigenstates, those coefficients, they are the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. So assuming the uh, uncoupled eigenstates are normalized, therefore those coefficients when squared, well the coefficients then, the, the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, they are then interpreted as uh, probability amplitudes, right? So if you square them, you get the probability, so like if you're, if you're expanding this out as a weighted sum of, uh, well, we're only talking, let's see, uh, we're talking in momenta, so, um, well, you, you, you expand it out in terms of the uncoupled eigenstates, uh, you'll have an appropriate uh, uh, expansion coefficient, you know, a C1, C2, and so on. And then uh, those Cs, those coefficients in the expansion, they are Klebsch-Gordon uh, coefficients by definition. When, when you expand out a coupled eigenstate in terms of a weighted sum of uncoupled eigenstates, right? Uh, so, so all just all just saying effectively is that um, you just you just square, and that's what makes them so convenient. You just square these Klebsch-Gordon coefficients to to give you the answer to the probability of getting this result for an electron one and this result for electron two. Um, your uh, particular value of n, you know, which which component? You know, what is that quantized discrete? Uh, value of the uh, orbital angular momentum of electron 1 along the z-axis. That's what m, m, l1. And of course, m will depend on the value of l, the angular momentum of, of your first electron. So, so m depends on l, so you put this little l down here to indicate that. And similarly, similarly for the second electron. Okay. So to find the probability of measuring ml1, 